Okay. If everybody's ready, we'll uh, start Peter off here. Okay. Uh, so I wanted to start with a bit about the perception versus the reality of the Wuhan Institute of Virology. You read all these uh, news stories, pictures of this being this huge building full of frightening viruses. I wanted to kind of humanize who we're talking about here. This is Xi Zhengli's group. She has a few scientists she works with, a bunch of grad students. These people on the right are who you're blaming if you think they created this virus. Um, and I think the scale of their operation is probably smaller than what we're imagining here with this group that's creating all these chimeras, all these different foreign cleavage sites. Um, I found something in the, in the Diffuse grant. It looks like these are their salaries. Ben, who is frequently called Patient Zero, he's making $11 an hour. I'm not saying he can't you know, destroy the world at that rate, but I think we could solve biosafety pretty easily by just giving him like a minimum wage job in the U.S. instead of whatever we're talking about in this debate. Um, the whole lab is larger than that. There's a few hundred, I think 500, 600 people total. But Xi Zhengli's group is one small part of that. She runs the group for emerging diseases. She had, uh, they did not do a lot of gain of function research as far as I can tell. I went through all of their, all their prior experiments and tried to categorize those. I think maybe three of them would count as gain of function research. And then maybe there's two more that they did in collaboration with a UNC, but the gain of function part was done at UNC. So that UNC is the real gain of function lab in the world for coronaviruses. Her group was more focused on the sampling of these viruses because those are in China and you have to do that part in China. They had this database with about 20,000 samples, but that's not 20,000 coronaviruses. It's actually about, uh, Xi Jinping says it's 2,000 samples with coronaviruses and about 200 with these uh, SARS family viruses. The actual sampling is not particularly dangerous. It's actually, it's hard to even grow these uh, virus from these samples. You can get RNA from them, you can sequence the virus frequently, but she's only ever managed to grow three of these viruses. So infecting yourself off one of these swabs is gonna be really, really hard. Um, they have recreated other parts of these viruses by like putting the spike of one of these sequences into the backbone of one of those three that they did culture before. And we know of them making at least eight like this. I think we need to define a few terms when I'm talking about spikes and backbones. This is COVID is this um, 30,000 nucleotide long virus. The beginning, uh, you know, spike is one small portion of that. And I'm going to call everything besides spike the backbone. Uh, so the, the beginning of this virus encodes these non-structural proteins that's tells it how to reproduce itself, um, basically. And then you've got the spike, the envelope, the nucleocapsid, and the, the membrane. And these fold up into these structural structures like the spike. So virologists in the past have done these experiments where they put the spike from one virus into the backbone of another virus. Uh, in 2015, they did this at UNC where they took a SARS backbone and uh, made it express the spike of a different virus. And then they did this eight times in 2017 at, in Wuhan. Uh, they chose those backbones because those are viruses that are very similar to the original SARS virus. So they generally work with these three viruses, SHC14, WV1, WV16, and these are all 95 plus percent similar to SARS-1. And so they, they're worried about another SARS outbreak. So they're curious about viruses that are similar to SARS. There's this diffuse proposal we're going to talk a lot about, and mostly the proposal talks about putting spikes into the bat backbones, WAV1 and SHC14. Uh, and they're interested in those again because those are similar to SARS. So if they did make uh, SARS-2, we have to ask first what backbone did they use? This is similarity. SARS-2 is definitely not these WIV1 backbones. These are uh, not similar at all across the genome. There's this virus ZC45, which is a little bit more similar, but a big dropout around the spike. Um, in 2020, there's this scientist, Li Meng Yan, she said it was made from ZC45. And then a lot of people said in 2020 that it was made from this virus, RATG13, which is like 96% similar, still not close enough to make uh, SARS-2, but there are a lot of theories about that. And some people say it was made from a secret virus. 
now we have two viruses that are incorporated into the theories. We have RTG13 and we have this uh, Banal 52, which is even a little bit more, more like 97% similar to SARS-2. Um, RTG13 was disclosed by Xi Jinping's group right in the beginning of the pandemic. They they found it in 2013, but they hadn't. Um, but then they noticed the similarity to COVID right away. Uh, you can't turn RTG13 into COVID. There's still over a thousand mutations between the two. That's about 40 years of evolution. But since it was the closest one, it featured in a lot of the theories in the first year of the pandemic. And it featured in, in a lot of different ways. Like some, some theories said it was made to use the virus. Other theories said it was fake, like it was a decoy. Uh, they all differed on how you would do it. Like it was passage through animals or it was mutated with drugs. There's also a lot of these theories that it was suspiciously renamed um, because it was originally called 4991, so sample name. And they renamed it because it's... Rhinophilus affinis is the RA, that's the bat, then TG is the place it was found, and 2013 is the year it was sampled. So if they're trying to hide something, it's a pretty bad way to do it by explaining everything like that. You also have to wonder, if, if they did make COVID from this virus, like why would they disclose it at all? Why wouldn't they just keep this secret? Uh, this was probably seen as an uninteresting virus prior to the pandemic because it's about 80% similar to SARS. And SARS-2 and SARS-1 are about 80% similar to each other. So a lot of people, a lot of scientists have been interviewed and have said that even if you had like a SARS-2 secret backbone before the pandemic, it's not clear whether people would even notice that's um, relevant because of the dissimilarity. There was um, this other theory that... When, when the lab first disclosed RATG13, they did not notice that there was a fur and cleavage site in COVID, but not in RATG13. They produced this alignment between the two, and it stops short of the cleavage site. And Yuri noticed this, and, and he saw that like the Q amino acid in the font there looks like it's cut off. And he had this theory that that was like censorship, or the lab's trying to hide something. Um, but if you actually go through the rest of the diagram, you can see all the Qs are cut off. So that's just the font they use. There's nothing sinister there. Is there something sinister about them not disclosing the fern cleavage site? It's hard to say. There were two other groups at the same time that noticed uh, COVID and or looked at COVID and they both missed the cleavage site. And then other people noticed it pretty shortly thereafter. Uh, you repeated that throughout 2020 and 2021. Um, Yuri finally admitted he was wrong about that in 2022, but he's just moved on to saying it's suspicious in other ways. Um, maybe we can play a short video of how he talked about this over time. Initially, they called it 4991, BATCOV4991, which is just the number of the sample. And it's just odd that they decided to rename it and never mentioned the, like, the original strain. This so is scientifically actually, speaking, this is unacceptable. You would not rename a strain and not at least leave some pointer that explains why you renamed it and allows somebody to trace it. And I think people should... Is the audio coming through okay with that? Great. So uh, casting a lot of suspicion based on this is a really important thing. Um, but uh, moving on the next year, Yuri's got a more elaborate theory. Is possible? I mean... My uh, thought is RATG13 is serially passage 491, passage in humanized mice, because RATG13 does not bind to the bat, affinis bat, renal office affinis bat receptor. So you've got, you know, first it was a theory it was misnamed suspiciously, and now we've got a theory that it was not actually the same virus. Um, and by late of 2021, Yuri's moved on to saying that RATG13 doesn't matter at all. So you could have just tuned him out for, you know, first year and a half of the pandemic. None of these theories actually mattered. It was more just like looking for things that sounded suspicious and you could, you know, podcast about these to cast some doubt on what the lab was doing. Um, and now they've got this diffuse theory, which is might be better, might be worse. It might be the same, just looking at things suspiciously. Um, it was later proven that both 49N1 and RATG13 are exactly the same, and they figured out the software that would automatically cut off the diagram at that point. There's probably nothing too suspicious here. 
uh, people also went through the old papers and found that these uh, this 491 was renamed multiple times in different, like sometimes it's RA4991, sometimes it's 4991-NP. They're just kind of bad at using a consistent terminology for all these viruses. And they also renamed these other ones, like WIV1, that had a sample number, but then once it became important, they gave it a, its own name. Uh, and then there's this like Mojong mineshaft thing, which is was really big in 2020, but that doesn't really factor in anymore. Um, the Trump State Department also talked a lot about RATG13. That was in that same memo where they made up the thing about the three sick researchers, or presumably made it up. Um, they said the lab was doing experiments on RATG13, but these were like the only experiment is maybe they sequenced it that we know of. Uh, again, you could not passage RATG13 to become, like even if you put it in a cell culture, it would take 15 years of mutation to get there. Uh, if you accelerated it somehow, you'd probably have some signature based on how you accelerated it. And there's not any good signature compared to like SARS and the closest virus. Uh, so the big question is, do they have a secret virus that they had used? And we have a few reasons to suspect they did not have a secret virus that was closer. The main one, or the one I find most convincing, is this paper that they published in 2020 where they disclosed 200 Sarbico viruses. And the paper was actually submitted back in um, August 2020, or August 2019. So at that point, that would be before any possible lab leak, and they'd have no reason to hide what they're working on and what they have. And then people got a FOIA copy of the original submission, and there's no viruses added, missing, changed between those two. So there's a really short time window there where they could find this new virus and then start working on it. Um, then there was this theory through 2020 that there were these eight other viruses they were hiding. A lot of people talked about this. Yuri and uh, Rosanna published about this, uh, and those were finally disclosed in 2021, and they weren't weren't even closely related. Not relevant, but those are those feature big in some of the books that have been written about lab leak. There's also this unpublished paper from 2018. So when you um, when you publish your genomes frequently, they'll be put in with like this embargo so that they show up later um, when to match the publication deadline. And this paper was uh, deemed uninteresting by the journals that it was submitted to, and so it just went in with this data embargo for four years. Everyone forgot about it. In 2022, the genomes were released automatically when the data embargo ended, and they had a copy of uh, RATG13 and these other eight in there, and I think it's about 160, 163 other viruses. So that's like a snapshot of what they had at the time, and there's no, no secret virus in there that you could make COVID with. So I, I talk about um, these talking points that just won't die for the lab leak. People still point at this um, Peter Daszak tweet where he's right before the pandemic started, he's talking about having 50 novel strains and people constantly tweet this back at him about, you know, why are you hiding these 50 strains? From his perspective, he's disclosed everything because they published this paper with 200 strains. This gets repeated by lots of people. Um, you know, so either he's lying, he knows that they have a secret virus or he's telling the truth, but the WIV has other viruses that he doesn't know about. Or maybe he's telling the truth and the lab doesn't actually have any secret viruses. But that's kind of hard, like, hard to prove, you know, because nobody's going to believe them at this point. If they shared their database tomorrow, either it has a secret virus and then everybody believes lab leak, or it doesn't have a secret virus and everybody says, well, why, why do you take out the secret one? It, it's hard to prove that negative. I'll skip the Dash Act interview. Uh, after his early January, he's still talking about infecting humanized mice with SARS viruses. Like, you'd think he'd start covering this up if he knew it was a lab leak. Uh, January 25th, 2020, somebody asks him about the lab leak theory, and his first response is to talk about those 50 SARS-related viruses. So if that was, like, some proof that he knows something about this lab leak, it's probably not the first thing he would say as soon as somebody talks about the lab leak. Um... And it, this is, of course, inconsistent. Like, Yuri maybe says that Desek didn't know anything, but frequently the lab leak says he's he's a big part of the conspiracy. Uh, in the last session, Root Claim said that they had 180 secret viruses, and they assigned a very high odds to a possible lab leak because one of these has to be, like, Banal 52, and one of them has to be, you know, a secret one they could create. 
I looked, I think I found where that 180 number comes from, because um, SAR didn't cite a source at all. And I think it's this line in the diffuse grant where they're saying over the past 15 years, they found 180 of these viruses. And uh, that's not 180 secret ones. That's just the, you know, matches up to the like 200 that they had in the Latine paper or the 160 they had in that other uh, 2018 paper. The numbers are pretty consistent and they're not going to hide them for 14 years straight. You know, they might, they could in theory have additional ones that they started sampling after Diffuse started, and there might be a few of those, but they're not going to have like 200 new ones. So, since we don't know which virus it was, we can't just look for the backbone. So, we have to look for, you know, features like these N glycans, the Ferg cleavage site, all the stuff that Yuri was talking about. Uh, and the Ferg cleavage site is the most famous one. The uh, spike protein has two functions one, it has to attach to the ACE2 receptor, and the second is it has to fused to the membrane of the cell. So it's got the S1 part that does the first, the S2 part that does the second, and it uses some host enzymes like furin or some other enzymes to cut the spike in part to make its job easier. Um, a yeah, furin site is... No, if you mind interruptions as much as you wanted. Um, I've always wondered, what is the point of the cleavage? Is there an easy way to explain, like, why go to the trouble of bind binding to ACE2 if you're then just going to sever your connection? Uh, I mean, you need, I guess you need two different proteins. So S2 is this elaborate protein that can, that can stick to the wall and pull these things together and, in, and then it can inject the RNA through. Um, but S2 cannot also like latch onto a cell by itself, um, or can't like home in on the cell. Um, actually, I think I can probably explain this a bit better in a moment. Okay. So a fern site is RXXR, which is... X is any amino acid and R is arginine. Uh, previous experiments used really good for cleavage sites by like RRKR. Uh, COVID is used as a suboptimal and kind of weird cleavage site. These are found in lots of natural coronaviruses, but none in sarbacoviruses, as Yuri said. The closest family is a hibicovirus. Uh, we have found, I think, two in that in that family. And we've also want, found one sarbacovirus that's one single mutation away from a cleavage site. So close, but not quite. Uh, also four out of the seven, seven human coronaviruses have a cleavage site at S1, S2. Um, there, there are actually two places you can put a cleavage site. One is this S1, S2 that we've talked about, and the other is this uh, S2 prime location. And like MERS has a site at both of those locations. Uh, I think SARS doesn't have either. Uh, there's multiple enzymes that do the cleavage, uh, not just ferns, only one of them. So it can still function. And this is also happens, um, uh, each of those enzymes allows a different method of cell entry. This is sort of interesting piece of trivia, not super interesting for the debate, but like one reason why hydroxychloroquine probably didn't work is it only blocks one of these methods of entry. And if you'd combine that with another drug, it might've actually worked. The other drug would be like Camastat or some something in that category. Uh, so the the thing that's unique about furin is it happens inside the cell as it's as the virus is being primed for exit, and so it's going to cut off the S1, and then all you have left is the S2, which is the spike that can like go out if there's an adjacent cell and just stick right into it, and that's what causes these like um, respiratory syncytia, I, I think they're called, in your lungs. This like cells fusing to each other. Um, I, I think if you, uh, if you actually cut off every one at the S1 and you only had the S2, it might not work systemically because they'd only be able to infect like the cell that's just right next to them, but maybe they wouldn't be able to home in on the other cells and find them. That's what they need the S1 for. Does that make a little sense, Eric? Yeah, it's possible. I mean, I think it might take a while to decipher all of the biology going on here. Okay. But, you know, just to get this, 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 is, this is what I've learned in my, you know, years of studying the lab leak. I guess when I heard all these podcasts, they say, like, it's a Frank cleavage site, it's the unicorn's horn, it's the smoking gun. But there's a lot of nuances here about, like, it's not actually a good Frank cleavage site that they put in there. And you need right. to come up with some reason why they picked this exact one. Uh, it does look like it's inserted if you make these diagrams. And, you know, everyone who sees this is initially suspicious. That's like Bob Gary wrote his email saying, I don't see how this happens in nature. 
but we have some theories now for how it could happen in nature. Uh, it's the overall similarity here to RATG13 is not suspicious. Like you can compare it to a lot of other most similar viruses, and they all have the same um, sequence on the left and on the right. So uh, it's also out of frame. This is one of the fascinating parts. So normally when you, you're a human designer, you think about like, what amino acids do I want? That's the function of it. And then you've picked the codons for those, and then you lay it all out. And in nature, you just get these random accidents. So here it's like replaced one of the codons from the one before, and then it hasn't fully finished the one there. So this this really leans towards nature accidentally put something in there, not, not a person planned this out. And it's out of frame, it kind of doesn't matter which close um, virus you pick, there it's out of frame for all of them. In theory, you could have a secret virus where it is in frame if the if the serine at the beginning it has the right codons. Uh, it's also out of frame relative to this uh, Banal 52 and these other viruses we found in Laos. And uh, even though it's really similar with the amino acids on both sides, uh, the nucleotides are different. So you can tell that, again, that it's not RATG13 with just this thing added. It's, you know, it's got enough mutations there that uh, they're not quite the same. They just look similar. Another thing I wondered is, you know, flu viruses have these cleavage sites. So I went through to look uh, if you just had two, uh, two flu strains, would it look inserted? And yeah, you see the same thing. The high, highly pathogenic ones often have this cleavage site, and some of the low pathogen, the you know safer strains have what looks like it's just missing in that spot. Uh, but we don't have like here. I guess we have some intermediates where it's like partial. And maybe if we had enough sarbacoviruses um, sampled, maybe we could see some of those intermediate steps. But we don't have those. So scientists have gone looking for can you find any kind of partial insert in nature? And in they have found a few. So like this is PRRA in COVID, and you can find this PAA in RMYN02, another sarbacovirus in nature. And then uh, in 2021, we had these uh, viruses in Laos, and we found four examples now where you have something that looks like it could be a partial cleavage site. The um, the P in PRRA is is suspicious because a cleavage site is just RXXR, like RRAR would be good enough, and there's no reason why a designer would have to add the proline at the beginning there. Um, and it's actually detrimental. Uh, they have a bunch of software tools that they can use to evaluate these beforehand. I've found one of them, this Prop 1 model. Um, so RRAR, like the best cleavage site would be RRKR. So if you're just designing an experiment to have a good cleavage site, you'd pick that. But RRAR, it's worse. Maybe you have some reason to pick that. And then you add the proline and it's even worse. Um, you know, 0.5 is a barely functional cleavage site. 1.0 is a really good cleavage site. I went through all the experiments I could find for previous cleavage site insertions, and they all used really good cleavage sites. They used uh, RRKR, or they used uh, sometimes RRSRR. These all have um, good uh, good cleavage in those models. They also generally did this all with pseudovirus, except for one, uh, this uh, Beijing study, where they did it in a chicken virus, but that shouldn't infect people anyways. Quick question on this one, Peter. Did they disclose yeah. the codon choices, or did they just give amino acids and all of those? Only, only one of these papers disclosed the codon choices. Um, I couldn't find them for the others. And the only one was this Dutch study, where they used five different Rs, right. and of those fives, not a single one was CGG. They, they picked all five other, there's six ways to spell arginine, and they picked everything but CGG. So that's, I mean, there might be some reason why China, Chinese scientists would prefer that, but I, I haven't seen any documented reason. Uh, minimal cleavage site is RXXR. You know, again, you don't need the proline. Um, Yuri suggested maybe they picked it because MERS has a proline there. MERS's first cleavage site is actually pretty bad. It's barely effective, a little over 0.5. It, I think its second cleavage site is actually good, and that's part of why MERS is a deadly virus. Um, and then they, they have done uh, you know, RSVR. Oh, also, MERS is PRSVR. So if you were going to be inspired by MERS, why don't just use the one that is in MERS? And if you put that in, it doesn't actually work well. They've done some experiments with that. 
Um, there's also, I don't know, yours had a bunch of theories over the years. He said that COVID's a self-spreading vaccine. I didn't quite understand what he's got out there. Or he says it's like designed to test like a pan coronavirus vaccine. And so it has to work on Mar SARS and MERS. And maybe that's why the proline's in there. I, he could maybe get into that more also. There's also this like PRRAR. There is that scene once in nature that I know of in this feline coronavirus. Um, and so then there's the theory that they were inspired by that. And one thing I was thinking about here is that like, if there was no PRRAR in nature, then the lab leak theory would definitely be, well, it's never found in nature, therefore it has to be a lab leak. But because there's one found in nature, the lab leak theory is, oh, well, they must have been inspired by that one. Since there's no like pre-specified lab leak theory, there's a million different ways you can design it to, to fit the evidence you find. Uh, there's this other obscure, Jeffrey Sachs says the RRAR is inspired by human ENAC, but that doesn't explain the proline. Oh, Yuri actually knows this before Jeffrey Sachs did. Give him credit there. Um, and a lot of these, like, people don't even agree on, people don't, lab leak people don't agree whether CGG is important. They don't agree on whether the human ENAC thing is important. Lab leak's just this, you know, very diverse set of different theories. Um, the other thing we've noticed as COVID's evolved is PRRAR is not optimal. Like, it keeps evolving away from that. The first thing was this uh, G614G mutation that it's not actually on the cleavage site, but it's near it, and it makes it better. But then it, the P turned into H with alpha, and then the, it turned into R with delta. And uh, at, with every step, you can evaluate these with the PROP1 model, and the cleavage gets better each time. So... Nature is following what you'd predict from theory. And I don't know, maybe this will turn into RRKR if you give it enough, give it 100 years. It's hard to see how that'll go. Proline also does this weird thing where it creates um, an inflexible protein. Like most amino acids uh, have a flexible structure, which is what you think you would need at this little loop that comes off. And proline has this limited angles. This is another reason why... If you're thinking about this in terms of software or design, it's just a really weird, unlikely choice. But nature can do whatever, and you know we've seen those peas in nature and those other similar bat viruses. So maybe it came from one of these. Um, Was you talked this a bit about understood before 2020. I believe so. Yes, I don't. I'd have to click through the paper to get the actual. But I think this was. Well, this paper mentions. Beta, Delta, Omicron, so I assume this is after Okay, I would have to go review the literature then. I think we knew this before 2020. I think this was a standard feature people knew about amino acids, but I guess I should say I'm uncertain or how many scientists know this or how. Was it understood that it, the protein being inflexible was relevant to a firm site? Uh, I'm, 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 I'm trying to, you know... I've never personally designed a, a coronavirus with a cleavage site, so I, I can't know everything that they would think about. I'm trying to go through simple metrics that they would use. And the the most obvious is just they'd use the best cleavage site and they put it in frame. Right. Um, and then I'm trying to think of, well, if they didn't do that, what are the pluses and minuses? So you can obviously use the prop model to see what would be good and bad. Um, the rigidity... Uh, seems like something that's well known about proteins and amino acids, because this is more protein folding than um, than virology specific. Uh, but I don't know if this is widely known to the point that a virologist would think through this as a good or bad thing. Okay. Um, lay this out by codons, these similar viruses. Um, you don't have to change a whole lot of these to turn it into PRRAR. Uh, you know, this, if the, Yuri has this theory that the lab secretly had one of these uh, PAA viruses, and then that's obviously why they'd fix it, but that kind of works both ways. Like, if it's close, then nature could also make that small change. Um, yeah, and these these were all discovered or, or at least published after the pandemic started, but Yuri kind of flips this theory on its head and says maybe the lab secretly had one of those and, and used them as their inspiration or as a starting point or something, which is kind of hard because now they need a secret virus, secret virus for the backbone, but they also need a, a second secret virus, which has the partial insert there, the PAA. And it also makes it really hard to disprove these lab leak theories because as soon as we find some kind of evidence in nature, like you get a new lab leak theory where it's like, oh, well, the lab knew that because they had they have all the viruses in China. And maybe they do, maybe they don't. It's hard to know what 
you know, the communication is, whether they had some unpublished copy of that paper. Um, there's, I, I guess what I would think about here is that like the PAA doesn't stand out at all until you've seen COVID. Like if you've seen COVID before you say, oh, it's got the proline, that's important. Maybe those are similar. But before we've had the pandemic, any virus is something you could turn into a fern cleavage site. You could take any of these at the bottom and you just put RRK and you've got a perfect cleavage site. But if you have one that says PAA at that spot, like there's nothing closer there. Um, and and also there is this difference. Yuri and I will probably get about this, get into this in the rebuttals, like whether there's this QT QT that's missing in some of these, and Yuri thinks maybe that's uh, important. But then you know if the lab only had one without the QT QT, then they'd need to know to put together both of those elements, which is something that you know to do now that you're using COVID, but you don't know to do that before the pandemic. Um, the QTQT is actually important. We found out it extends the cleavage site into this like longer loop that's easier to cleave. And if you do a mutation to delete that, the virus doesn't work as well. So maybe they could do some kind of modeling and discover that before the pandemic, but that's more the kind of thing. It's taken the whole world and groups all over the world years to figure this stuff out. There's this other one I talked about, this um, Sarbacovirus, virus, which has one mutation away from an FCS. And uh, if you mutate that into its RAKQ, if you turn it into RAKR, it actually doesn't work because it doesn't have that extra ex extension like the QTQT, which would make it like long enough to, to cleave. Um, one thing, another thing we've learned as the pandemic has happened is you get these insertions into COVID as it mutates from one human to another. So one thing we have seen is a 12 nucleotide out of frame insertion right next to the front cleavage site. So we can argue about the frequency, but we know that is something nature can do. And we also have seen insertions with uh, the double CGG in them. So again, it's not impossible, maybe an argument over the odds that could be interesting. Uh, sometimes those insertions are copied from elsewhere in the same virus, like you know, 15 nucleotide insertion and they found where it came from. But sometimes you can't actually find them because maybe they came from human RNA, or maybe they came from some unknown source, you know, they can be copied from another virus. Uh, we can map where these insertions have showed up. And this is the spike portion in the, the N-terminal domain is the beginning of the spike. That's what's seen the majority of them, but you've also seen some right here near the S1, S2. Um, and we can map like where they came from and where they were inserted. Uh, insert into the spike is is abnormally high frequency relative to the others. Um, and I think as Yuri pointed out earlier, these are there's always gonna have a length that's a multiple of three, you know, three, six, nine, whatever. They're, um, they could insert with, let's say eight instead, but that's just gonna break the genome because everything's gonna be shifted by one and nothing's gonna work afterwards. So I think even though the evolution could do that, it's gonna get selected away right away because it breaks uh, the whole genome. So. I found one study that tried to map out the frequencies, and I think I came up with um, about 1 in 2,700. If you pick a random strain, it's going to have some 12 nucleotide insertion in it, but some of those are duplicates. So it might be more like 1 in 40,000 to find the unique insertion. Uh, the, the really hard part to say here is what's the underlying rate of mutation? Because if it, like with the the insertion of eight nucleotides, that's just gonna break the genome. So that could happen, but it's, you're not gonna find it. And the, the other thing is if you get a 12 nucleotide insertion right at the cleavage site, well, COVID already has a good cleavage site. So most of the time, if you get that now, it's gonna break the genome and it's gonna, your virus is gonna fail. But on the other hand, if you're talking about the virus that doesn't have this site and it's making a bunch of random mutations and that's a highly um, you know, helpful mutation, then you might end up seeing that selected for, and it could be found with a higher frequency than the base frequency. When you uh, said we, that in GSAD, one out of 100 have an insertion, this is an insertion relative to what? Uh, relative to Wuhan Hu one, I guess, relative to the base. So like some of these viruses in this database might be descended from each other or from a common source that had the insertion you know, factors like this makes it much harder to understand what this number means. Yeah. 
Uh, relative to the base, I guess. I guess you would be that number. Only three hundred are it, unique, because some of these are derived from the same source. Right, because you okay. oh, because you're sequencing the same strains over and over. So if, yeah. if one strain, like if if a twelve nucleotide insertion at the very beginning of the pandemic was highly valuable, you'd find it in a hundred percent of these. Mm -hmm. It would be one in one. Okay. And so we have seen like this one that's uh, you know right at the um, right at the FCS. And that's AT.1. And this is not, this is just like one strain that was found in Russia. And it's been found multiple times in Russia. Um, so it's going to come up more than once in this database. Okay. Uh, and that's then you have to, to clarify. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and we could, you know, we could probably dig into this data if, if it comes down to like how important this exact rate is. Because this is one of the most interesting things about the lab leak theory is this fern cleaver site is really interesting. We don't know where it came from. Uh, a lot of people have tried to find matches. Uh, this is early 2020. Somebody found a almost similar strain in a, another bat virus, HKU9. I don't think that's the source. It's not quite close enough. Uh, Yuri found a, an example in pangolin RNA. Christian Anderson found almost the whole insert actually in one of the samples from the market in the raccoon dog sample. He found 10 out of 12 in the raccoon dog DNA. Um, still not close enough as 10 out of 12. But if you just you know blast the sequence, look for it in a database, you can find it in hundreds of matches for humans and lots of dozens of matches for raccoon dogs and you know probably other species too. So I don't think we're ever going to know exactly where it came from if it came from host DNA because there's so many possibilities. Can, um, or, Peter, can I ask a question on that one? Yeah. What's the, so, like recombination in flu viruses, fairly common. What's the like? I don't know anything about this, and I'm curious. It seems like you're positing possibly a recombination as the source of it with the like, okay, it comes from pangolins or recon dogs or something like that. What's known about recombination frequency um, or, you know, jumping transcript frequency? Uh, we, we know it can come from either another virus or another place in the same virus, or it can come from the host. Um, I don't know the relative frequency of those, of those insertions. I could probably dig into that more if, that becomes relevant. I think even a qualitative answer to that question, I guess, right, like like from the flu's perspective, that's always been a concern with pandemic flus is that they're going to recombine in a pig or an avian host or something like that. I think um, it would help clarify the potential zoonosis story here for me if I could know that it's actually fairly likely to recombine in a, an animal or something like that. So that's where okay. it's Okay. Um, how am I on time, by the way? You have 52 minutes left. Great. Um, I think I'm talking faster than last time. I, that's hard to say. So, um, so yeah, I don't. I don't think this looks like something a person would design because of the proline, the alanine, and the out of frame. Um, and I don't know. I, I pers. I guess I might lean more towards thinking it came from one of those bats with like the partial insertion because that already has part of it in place, and that seems more likely than the clean twelve nucleotide insert. But even as a twelve, a single twelve nucleotide insert, it's not this impossible. If we could do the odds and say that's like a one in a trillion thing, then that, I think that might really rule out zoonosis. But I think if it's more like a one in you know ten thousand, forty thousand, whatever, and then evolution favors it, I think that doesn't make zoonosis impossible. Um, another thing is it can be copied from all these sources, the host or the virus, and it can be copied with a frame shift, and it can be copied from a complementary strand which is when you copy RNA, um, there's a, a temporary version where the Cs and Gs are swapped and the As and Ts are, to, are swapped. So like it doesn't have to be CGG, it could be the inverse of that. And we know that all, a lot of these insertions go into the spike and even the S1, S2 junction seems to be one spot where they can show up. Uh, um, just to be clear, when you talk about the complementary RNA strand, you're talking about when um, you're reading from DNA, right? You're not talking about... Uh, RNA is RNA reproduces itself with RDRP, where it like makes a temporary copy of the RNA, where it's it's both reversed and the nucleotides are swapped. So even without DNA, you have a, a complement there. Um, so I'll introduce the CGG theory with a Robert Redfield clip. Um, Dr. Redfield. Did you agree, in your opinion, with Dr. Anderson's assessment at the time that this virus did look engineered? I was concerned because of uh, the presence of the furin cleavage site that we've talked about. And I think it's important to understand what that cleavage site does. 
that cleavage site totally changes the orientation of the binding domain of COVID. So it now, which could not see the ACE2 receptor, which is a human receptor, it totally changes the orientation now. So it has high affinity for a human receptor. So that furin cleavage site bothered me. It didn't seem that it belonged there. And then when you look at the sequences that it used, and it's beyond the committee, but I know many of you have looked into it, the sequences that they used in those 12 nucleotides for arginine were the arginine sequences, nucleotide triplet, that coded for the human arginine. So why did this virus have the arginine sequences for human there, not bat? It was very disconcerting to me. It looked like... Um, so that's kind of like the most simplified version of this, um, you know, ready for Congress version of it. And his... Um, his theory. Oh, also, I should point out that like everything you said there was just kind of made up. The the furin cleavage doesn't change the receptor binding domain. Those are two entirely different portions of the virus. Um, the CGG is rare in COVID. I'm saying it's 4.6 percent. Yuri says it's 2.6 percent. I'm gonna have to dig in to figure exactly what we're doing there. Different. I think it might be because Yuri's picked different segments of the GNA, of the genome, and there's actually small segments in between those. So I might be including the junk DNA in those segments. That would be my best guess. And if it's just copied from some random location, it can copy from any spot. So I don't see why you would exclude those. Um, it's also a low in every kind of human virus, even like this is a common cold, human uh, OC43. Um, and this is actually not a difference between humans and bats. Humans and bats are both 20%, but it's the difference between humans and viruses. The viruses are all like 5%. Uh, and the CGG doesn't make sense in viruses because actually the immune system recognizes it. And so it, there's this uh, TLR9 uh, that recognizes Cs and Gs that are adjacent to each other, and that um, activates the immune system. So the first virologist that looked at this actually didn't say, hey, this is a sign of it's engineered. They said, hey, this is a sign that this is weird and not engineered because you wouldn't think to do the CGG because it would be bad for the immune system. And both this Gallagher and Anderson, who both noticed that early on. Um, I wanted yeah. to ask a question there, but this might be a longer one, so kick it to um, rebuttals if so. So the fact that it might be more immunogenic because it's a TLR9 ligand um, doesn't immediately seem to me like that would be bad in the context of engineered viral research. So, for instance, the H1N1 flu, when they were, you know, trying to figure out what about the Spanish flu, the H1N1 flu was so bad, the some researchers figured out that, well, okay, maybe it caused a cytokine storm. You actually got a substantially increased immunogenicity, and you got more production of cytokines, and that's what made it deadly. So it's not a priori seemingly out of the question that you might want to engineer it that way. How does your evidence speak to that? I think it's actually more like the immune system can um, disactivate the virus more easily at the CPG. Just binding, binding to TLR9 would just trigger, you know, an immune cascade and ultimate cytokine okay. production. It's not okay. Like so, yeah, you, 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 could, you could posit that that was what they were going for in the experiment. Um, every, you know, everything here is speculation on what the lab would do. So if you have a theory that CGG is going to activate the immune system more, and maybe they're trying to make a bad virus that causes a cytokine storm, then you can posit that they did that. All I'd ask is that you put a probability on them making that choice. You know, a lot of this is like, they could have picked the alanine and the proline and the outer frame, but each of those are unlikely choices. And once you add all those like small probability unlikely choices, you, it becomes pretty unlikely that they that they leaked it. Totally. Okay. I think I meant H5N1, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so another thing I noticed that was interesting is like this CGG theory was not a part of the lab leak theory at the beginning. Like Yuri went through the, a codon analysis of the whole genome back in 2020 and he didn't notice it at all. He said, there's nothing unique about the, um, the codons, you know, so like Xi Jing Li missed the fern cleavage site, but Yuri missed the CGG. Uh, and then this has really grown. Like some people, okay. Alina Chan doesn't believe it as important Robert Redfield says it's super important. Stephen Quay did this Bayesian analysis, and he says things like, when scientists add a dimer of arginine codons, they invariably use the word CGG, CGG. And he's linked sources for all his other claims, but he doesn't put a link there. And as far as I can tell, that's just made up. Because I went through these other experiments, and like we had this Dutch study that used five arginines and not a single CGG. The closest I could find for evidence there was a Yuri claim where there's some experiment where they use three, and one of the three is a CGG, 
and it's not like a Wuhan experiment, but one of the authors is in China and knows Xi Zhengli, so therefore maybe Xi Zhengli used lots of CGGs. Um, so this is interesting. Um, I tried to figure out some of the frequency here. Oh, um, Yuri said there was none of these in nature. I think he might be right, but there, there's some, there's like none in Sarbico viruses maybe. There's a, there's a MERS strain that has it, and there's like a bat virus that has it, and there's the feline coronavirus. There's the PRAR, and it does CGG, CGA, so close, not quite. Um, because it be, can be copied out of frame, the odds aren't quite what you'd think with the like one, you know, 3% squared. Frequently lab leak theory just says it's 3%. It's 3% squared, it's a one in a thousand choice, therefore it's a lab leak. But it's really more like the lab doesn't have any preference that we know of, so it's like one in six for each of their CGGs. Square that, it's like one in 36 for the lab, and then you try to compare that to what would happen in nature. And so this is um, Guy Gadbot, who's actually a lab leak supporter, but he just doesn't believe in this part of the lab leak. And he did a good analysis where he looked at lots of coronaviruses, looked at all the possible frame shifts, the complements, and it would be like 1 in 200, you'd get that. So 200 divided by 36, base factor 5.5. Yeah, that could be lean towards lab leak, but it's not, you know, super, it's not the 1 in 1,000 evidence. And then if it came from the host, the odds are it's more like base factor 1 or base factor 2, but it depends on exactly what host it is. So, and then maybe, I don't know, you could maybe weight those two because you don't know where it came from. So if one's like 1 in 5 and one's 1 in 1, maybe the average is like... One in 2.5. Um, kind of obscure point, like they didn't optimize other codons. Um, oh, another thing, uh, Yuri mentioned that like the, the vaccine designers favored CGG in their vaccines, but they both of the vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna, they made this, this PRRA in their vaccine and neither one of them used the double CGG there. So whatever optimization program they used there, I think they used like CGG AGA I'd have to look up the exact, but neither one of them use that. So it's not a normal thing that comes out of like a codon optimization program. Um, and I also point out that because this isn't like a pre-specified theory, it's just something that's organically grown as part of the lab leak, you could probably do this for CGA and CGC. Wouldn't be quite as good of a theory because the ratio isn't as high, but like Robert Redfield could still sit in front of Congress and make that theory and people would still believe him. Um, and so the, the interesting thing we've noticed is that this is actually doesn't mutate away. There's lots of different ways it could mutate away by a single mutation and, and still be RR. But um, the latest data I found was still 2021, but it was still found in 99.85% of uh, wild circulating COVID. And I actually found a, a lab that tried mutating it away to um, AGG, AGG to see if that would be better or worse. And the CGG actually worked best. Um, and it was a really weird, subtle reason. It was, um, it slowed down the ribosomes as, as it was translating. And because they were slowed down, the proteins folded more accurately. So it produced less proteins, but the virus was actually more infectious because of the accuracy there, presumably. Um, so they didn't, they only tried AGG. They should ideally try like every combination. there, are all like 35 other doublets, but that might actually that might be our best guess of like evolution actually favors this because it works a little better for this subtle reason. So even if it was inserted for another reason, it might've turned into that over time. Uh, we have this other debate over whether this was pre-adapted for people. Um, when I used to believe the lab leak, this was one of the papers that really confused me. Um, this was from uh, Chan and Jan in 2020 and they, they're pointing at SARS and they're saying, in the early phase, it's mutating a lot, and then it's slowed down, whereas like COVID looked like it's ready to go. But what's actually going on here is there's like multiple introductions in the early phase, and there's a lot of host diversity. So these are already strains that are different from each other. And there was also one step here where there's a single mutation that was like 29 uh, mutations all in one deletion, which wasn't actually host adaptation. We've done it, checked in a lab and found that was detrimental, but it just sort of propagated in this orange outbreak because of the founder effect. Um, and so I tried to I tried to reproduce this myself, including a, you know, I added all the early cases and then this orange is the that outbreak. And then I added the actual civet cases in there or the civet strains and they had this huge diversity already. 
Um, and then there were other interesting things like the, the Hubei civets might have actually been closer to the early cases. We talked about, about that last time. Uh, I'm sorry so, to interrupt. Uh, I'm sorry yeah. on the previous slide because uh, the last time we talked about the 29 nucleotide um, deletion, I just want to make it clear. So you're saying that all of the orange cases have this 29 nucleotide deletion? Yes. And the first blue case does not. And the orange cases are not descended from the first blue case. I cannot, I cannot tell you what the tree is for the blue cases. I know there's more than one, um, more than one introduction in those blue cases, but I haven't put in the work to figure out exactly what the tree is, whether that's two or whether it's more. So the very first ones on the left here don't have the 29. Um, I don't know if the 29 jump is right there or if it's like, you know, there to there. So absent enough evidence, it's hard to tell what the phylogeny here is, but we can tell these are all related because they do have the same mutation. Okay. And also they're con also they're traced to each other because it's the like those Hong Kong hotel that took SARS International. Right. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so you know I thought this was good evidence for the lab leak, but it's not really great evidence. Um, it's not the worst I've seen. Like Robert Redfield also got in front of Congress and he just told Congress that SARS doesn't transmit from one human to another. Um, and then Yuri and I disagreed with Mink. Um, I thought this was the most. Um, most convincing diagram, this is showing like mutation rate and it's a histogram by species. So the average for human and deer is similar and the average for human and mink is also similar, though there is like this long uh, long tail on the right. Um, I looked into this a little more last night to try to figure out why we were in disagreement and I pulled up as many studies as I could about mink and I, I turned these into mutations per year to try to make it comparable. And then I pulled up a few different studies on humans and so we had a few different values, like whether that was 27, he was saying from Picar, or you know 37. One study, I think this is unreliable. It has to be because that's twice as high. But all the mink ones were saying like one said 42, one was saying 23, one said 54. And then Yuri's value, I think it would be like 200. So he's probably picked the highest rate of every possible study. And I looked at the paper he cited, which actually has five different numbers in it. And depending, you know, he's picked the highest number from the highest paper, which is, you know, probably not representative of the rest of the published research. Um, there were other... Sorry, uh, Peter, going yeah. back to us one more... Yeah, uh, sorry, the various rate comparison slide. Yeah. Um, what These mink populations are all farmed mink, so they're... Yes. Okay. Um, and then the deer population, is that wild deer? It would be wild deer, yeah. Okay. And, and there is also, I think we're also in disagreement over whether it's perfectly adapted to people because Yuri just pulled up that slide where he said at the beginning it was like 27, 36, whatever mutations per year in people. But then once it's alpha and delta, I think we're now in agreement that it slowed down in people once it got to the alpha and delta strains. So if it did slow down, that says it wasn't perfectly adapted to people. And there's also these things like it got the D614G mutation and like it's pretty well adapted to people, but it's not perfect, you know, it's not this, um, it's really debatable what, how well adapted to each of these species it is. Okay, I think that ultimately the thing that I'm curious about here is how I can extrapolate from what I presume are fairly inbred populations in like a production animal in a mink to a fairly outbred population in terms of immune system or something like that. So that might just be a place. I, I, I don't have an expectation oh, there. I, I don't know anything about like whether the diversity of the population matters. I guess for humans, you could compare countries and find like, you know, ethnically homogenous pe populations versus non and see if that matters. I don't think it really matters which country. I think COVID's pretty consistent across countries. And Yeah, but I would even expect that human individual humans would like all ethnically homogeneous people would still have more immune system diversity than a yeah. an animal. But and just, just to be clear, this is an interesting and complicated question because there is like mink do see these characteristic spike mutations that happen pretty fast. Like uh, we'll talk about this more later when we get to the ferret slide. So there are signs that happen in mink that don't happen in humans, but I don't think the signs are reflective of the average. I think this is really just like um, you know, most of the studies say that's not true and Yuri's picked one that's really out of line with the other studies. So I'm not saying this is settled and there's a lot of interesting questions you can ask here, but I don't think there's anything cut and dry either saying it's perfectly adapted to humans, but it's not adapted to these other species. That's just a complicated scientific question. Um, and people make it a lot simpler. This is one of Yuri's co-authors, uh, Stephen Quay, who said like, ACE2 binds better to COVID's receptor than 410 other animals. 
And it, you know, he's saying this in 2022. I think the study actually came out a lot earlier. He's saying this is proof that it's humanized mice. Um, this is super misleading. The way they ranked the species was like they found these 25 contact residues and they said how many contact residues are shared between each species and humans. And so human has 25 in common and the others are lower by design there. And that's not actually evidence of ACE2 being uh, worse. You actually need to like model the binding of these species. You know, these are like the contact residues all drawn out. It's just like what is in contact between um, the virus and the the ACE2. And then there's also not agreement between these studies of whether human is optimal. Once you do that binding, I found a bunch of different studies here. And so like mink and ferrets actually had a higher ACE2 binding than humans in one of these studies. Uh, and a lot of other animals were close, but not quite. Um, I found another study that said bamboo rats were higher than humans, though that study actually said it doesn't bind to mink. And then an, a third study said that there's like 44 species that all bind better to, to humans than, or other species than to humans. So you can't really cite one computational model and say that's the evidence. There's just not a lot of uh, consensus there. And that also makes you wonder, like, if you were designing this in a lab, I mean, I don't think you're designing this like de novo. I think you're, you're picking one virus that you found, but you couldn't like engineer it and actually pick the right ones because all the studies don't agree. And even the in vitro ones weren't super, weren't all in agreement. I found a few of those and you can maybe rule out some species, but, you know, comparing two of these, you didn't find the same species on top. So that's also, you know, makes you wonder, like, could they screen these viruses and tell which is the one that binds best? Maybe they could tell it binds well, but I don't know if they could, like, pick the optimal one. Um, there's another theory that was designed early in 2020 where there were, like, because you can compare, um, let's see, RATG13 is very similar to COVID except for this, it's the green line here, high similarity, but then it drops out in the RBD portion of the spike. But then we found this pangolin virus, which is the blue line, which which matches really closely in that part. And so um, this created this pangolin chimera lab leak theory where those two had been combined to produce the to produce COVID. Um, and that was Yuri's 2020 idea. And then we've in 2021 we found this banal 52 virus, which actually is closer than the pangolin viruses, and it's nearly identical to the SARS-CoV-2. So like a lot of scientists updated there saying, oh, well, we found this feature in nature, so this probably came from nature. But um, the, oh, and then we've found a few more of these. There's one in China. I think there's like three in, three in Laos, one in China, and one in Vietnam now, something like that. Um, the lab leak also adapted, like instead of saying, oh, this doesn't mean it's a lab involvement, they said the lab leak theory just got even stronger because that just means the lab secretly had that virus, which is, you know, possible, but that's, it just makes it really hard to argue against this theory because anytime there's absence of evidence, that means the lab must have created it. And anytime there's presence of evidence, like the partial, the PAA insertion, the RBD, that means the lab secretly had that. And this can kind of go on forever. Like, you know, if you find an even better bat virus, that means the lab has that. Or if you find a, even if you find like a raccoon dog virus, you could probably make a lab leak theory oh, that just means they had the raccoon dog fires. Like, how else would it get from, you know, if you find it in Yunnan, you could say, well, that just means the lab was sampling viruses in Yunnan. Um, Yuri's also kind of moved on to saying the pangolin viruses didn't exist. Now they're like a lab sequencing accident. Um, SARS is not optimized for humans, like Stephen Quay is saying. There's a bunch of different ways to measure it. This is just sort of growth in cells. It grows well in civet cells. Um, raccoon dogs are okay. Some, some bats are okay. There's a few things here that are like, maybe you can rule out some kinds of like hedgehogs. That's one I've wondered from the, the lab data because, or from the market data. Um, but we haven't done a whole lot of like, uh, actual in vivo testing. Really, we'd want to test like the five most likely species and infect them with COVID and see what happens. And that would tell us more likely what the host species was. Another thing I got into, uh, sorry, how am I doing on time? 30 minutes. 30, okay. Uh, another question I keep asking myself is, could you make COVID in a lab? You know, the, the, we've got these um, diffuse proposals where they're talking about a lot of curious things that they would want to try. And 
they're saying we'll grow it in vero cells and HAE cultures and uh, we can rule out some of these as not the answer because like if you grow COVID in these vero cells it loses the vern cleavage site and like very very rapidly so it, it has not spent much time in these cells um, and a lot of a lot of scientists will just stop there and say oh you can't make COVID in a lab but I didn't want to just rule that out because there's lots of other ways you could make it so I looked up a lot more studies Calu3 cells, uh, these are kind of a lung, like a lung cancer cell, immortalized lung cell, and they don't lose the cleavage site, but you do get these unique mutations in the envelope protein, um, so you'd still be able to tell if it was made in those based on that. And really any kind of cells you, you use are going to leave some signature, is what we find here. Um, Yuri asked about the human airway cells, I hadn't looked this up, but I added a slide. I found one experiment where they actually grew it in the HAE cells, and the fern cleavage site was preserved in nine out of 11 of these cultures. These are harder to work with because you actually, they come from like a donor patient, not from like an immortalized cancer cell. Um, so that would be another case where like, um, the lab has actually never worked with these before in their published work, but like UNC has. So you have to add like a probability of, did they have this technology that UNC had and, and where did they get it, the cells from? Um, but it sort of works. It does still have adaptations to cell culture. You get these deletions in the M protein. So it hasn't it hasn't spent much time in these cells. You can maybe imagine this case where like you put it in cell culture and it just like infects somebody right away. Um yeah, I went through all their all their experiments on PubMed and I couldn't find them talking about uh using HA cells before. Um UNC did use those. And and again this is like Nothing rules out that they couldn't make this, but there's so many steps that you have to put some probability on that it starts getting less and less likely, in my opinion. Um, some people also said that they could make it in vero cells if they use this exogenous trypsin, which is functions like the Tempris 2 enzyme that the cells would nat that some cells would naturally express. So I looked into the experiments there. Um, if you use a low level of trypsin, you still lose the cleavage site. If you use a high level of trypsin, you keep the cleavage site, but you get a bunch of mutations again. So it's another case of like, maybe you can make it this way, but it has to has to not have been in culture for a long time. And um, that I, another thought there would be like, if you're saying it's human adapted because it's spent a long time in culture, that's that would be in conflict with this idea. Like maybe you could make it in a cell culture if it pops out and infects somebody on the first or second passage. But if you're saying it's pre-adapted because it's spent a long time culturing, then that's really in conflict with this idea that it's uh, popped out right away. Um, transgenic mice, a lot of theories talk about those. Those have a mutation almost right away called um, spike mutation 501 N501Y. And you can probably rule out the transgenic mice that way because it doesn't have those. And that's also a beneficial um, mutation in humans. So it wouldn't just revert back after the virus jumped species. There are other lab leak theories about uh, using ferrets in the lab. And um, this is what I was talking about with mink. They get this um, 501T mutation uh, really quickly. So that would argue against, it be, uh, against ferrets or mink being the original host. One thing we did notice is we've infected raccoon dogs with the virus on one occasion, and there were none of these characteristic mutations. So we should probably repeat that with other strains and more experiments, but with the data we do have, there's nothing that rules out raccoon dog as a host. So diffuse grant is, um, yeah, says all kinds of crazy things about spraying bats in caves with, uh, gels and, uh, has a bunch of different supposed experiments they're going to do. It's kind of hard to understand what they were and weren't doing. The most important things, or the, the things that give me pause for believing it are, you know, the grant was rejected. Of course, they have other funding, so maybe they still did this stuff secretly. Um, more importantly, they were going to do it in University of North Carolina because they, they're the people that have more experience with the chimeras and the HAE cells and all these things. Uh, you know, they talk about Vero cells. You couldn't make it that way. The grant says they were going to focus on the S2 cleavage site, not the S1, S2. Maybe they were interested in both. Um, and they talk a lot about the WV1 and SHC014 backbones. 
And I think there's a, a strong argument that they were still only interested in the viruses that are, um, I can pull out some more quotes from this later, but they talk about like, we're only going to work on full length viruses if they're within 5% similarity to SARS. So would they notice that this virus is important if they find it? Um, because it may be a binds well to ACE2 and maybe they can figure that out, but it's not similar to SARS and it's going to fail that screening step. Um, also, a lot of these theories don't really match how researchers work. Like when you do an experiment, you want to learn something by changing one variable. So you start with a known backbone and you put in a new spike or you start with a known spike and you put in a cleavage site. And here this is kind of like just doing everything at once where you start with a brand new full length uh, backbone plus a you know a new spike plus this novel cleavage site that nobody's ever worked for plus like Yuri says also they're doing the N-glycan thing and the FAO1 site thing. And there'd be this huge body of experiments they'd already have to do before they get to this one. And I guess all those other ones have, would have some leak potential too. So like if you started with the RRKR, like the good cleavage site, that one could leak before you get to the bad cleavage site. And if you started with like a COVID spike in a WIV1 backbone, well, it's still got the, you know, the good RBD. So maybe that's human infectious and that could leak before you got to the, um, the full length, the new backbone. Um, and then they're assuming this is all done in secret. I don't know their publishing rate. Maybe, maybe they wouldn't publish it, the intermediate steps that that's hard to know. And then of course it leaks, it migrates across town and finds the closest raccoon dog at the market and starts spreading there without like leaving a trace at the, at the virus. And then, and then after that's all happened, they release this RATG13, you know, really similar virus and like hope that nobody notices the insert. Um, I don't think this is likely. And I think we need to kind of add these factors to a Bayesian analysis. Um, I'll probably come up with a better version of this when we get to the week three, but I think there's just a lot of things you, a lot of these weird choices you need to add odds on before you accept the theory. Um, I have another Yuri video, but I don't, Yuri, like Yuri and Stewart had a debate and, and Stewart said that Diffuse couldn't create COVID and it seemed like Yuri agreed with him there, but he's kind of disagreeing this time. But I think maybe it'd be better to go on to questions or something else with this time. Do you guys have judges have questions or I could move on to talking about like lineage A, lineage B or stuff like that with my free time. What am I up to? Like 20 minutes left? 20 two minutes left. I'm definitely interested in lineage A, lineage B Likewise. discussion. I, I don't know. You haven't said anything about it so far today, so I'd be very curious to hear what you have to say. Okay. Let's see. So, I mean, it's kind of a general point. I want to say that, um, it's hard to argue with LabLeak because there's so many different versions and so many things I need to work through. Like, this is what we went through last week where like Root Claim said the first case wasn't at the market. It was this December 8th guy, but then it was the first two visitors weren't at the market. And then there were lots of early cases. And I kind of worked through a lot of these and I think we came to some consensus, but we like, we didn't agree on, agree on the Mahjong room and we didn't agree on the ventilation. And maybe we're going to have to rehash some of these next time. And it's hard because there's so many different objections. And I think we're going to go through like a similar process today. Yuri's saying like lineage B started at the market, but lineage A actually came first. But also he's saying that Prokov 2 came before lineage A. And he's also saying that this like sample at the market is mutated or it's fake or it's unimportant or something like that. Um, he also says there are these intermediate genomes. And then finally he says like, okay, even if there were two lineages, the two lineages came from the lab. And so these are all things I need to address separately. And some of these are really easy and some are really hard um, or more complicated. Let's just start with some of the easiest ones. Could the lineage A sample, at, he said the sample at the market was put in culture and that it reverted from B to A. And we know this is pretty much impossible because it's like, it's two specific mutations you're calling for. If you pick one mutation at random, it's a one in 30,000, it's that right mutation. And if you have to specify two that happened, that's like one in 900 million. So you could get two mutations in culture, but you can't get the exact two that you're expecting. So I think we can rule that one out right away. Um, also, just for the record, reading the paper, it says the A20 sample was not cultured. 
they say that they did um, uh, sell new Super Nintends for these three samples, but it's not one of those. So it looks like they just resampled it with um, Amplicon sequencing, and that's how they got the uh, more reads out of it. And then another one is, uh, were there two spillovers at the lab? This also seems extremely unlikely because both of them were found at the market and like centered on the market. Um, and so I was saying in the first debate, it's like one in 10,000 that's going to go from the lab to the market. But, you know, and there's some debates of like whether that, that data is accurate, what, what's the traffic, does the ventilation matter? So maybe it's not exactly one in 10,000. We can argue that next time. But if it went from the lab to the market twice, I get to square that number. So one in 100 million, that's another thing we, I don't think we need to think too hard about that. Peter, but can then, I interrupt there with a question? Yeah. Um, so this, um, I mean, I initially um, pushed SAR on this a little bit in debate one about the question of if it had to come, if the exposure or the lab leak had to be into a human or it could be an environmental exposure because they the root claim had initially cited um, evident or had cited uh, priors uh, about environmental um, product or environmental spills would that an environmental spill seems like would still be consistent with two it showing up at the market twice like how it, would be, it would be everywhere though like that would be you'd have that would be the kind of thing where you have ten thousand cases over town and and then like we did like the exponential math last time and we kind of worked out that there have only been like twenty cases by the time it's it's blowing up at the market but and so it's the odds that these first twenty cases you know and, and those, one of those first twenty could have been at the lab but it's just it's really unlikely that and also Sar was saying like it grows really fast at the lab and it, it tried going to a bunch of places, but it only stuck at the lab. And that's also unlikely because you only have like 20 chances for it to go somewhere. Um, so I don't think they're really arguing for the the environmental leak, though that did come up. Um, Prokov 2, there's a whole bunch of these that we have to work through, the intermediates. Prokov 2 is probably the easiest one. Um, you know, lineage A is two mutations closer than lineage B. And some of these Prokov 2, they either have 18060T and or 29095T, uh, which are even more close to the bat viruses. Um, Yuri cited this study from Jesse Bloom, um, and he he did note this here, saying that only mutations above 21,000 are shown, and that's because these were only sequenced above 21,000. So when you say what 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 do these viruses have at position 18060? You don't know because they weren't sequenced. So when Jesse Bloom's table says substitutions relative to ProCov2, it should say unknown. And then I think Yuri's highlighting this one and saying it has 29095, and he's assuming it also has 18060. We don't know that because it wasn't sequenced at 18060. So we do know that there are ones that have 29095, and there's also ones that have the 18060, but we don't know if any of those have, have both. I don't think there are any double reversions like that. And so that already should give you one question of like, reversions are possible because there's two possible Prokof 2s here, and one of them has to be a reversion and only one of them can be the actual original strain. Uh, the other thing I wanted to know is just like, what are the odds you're gonna get a reversion at all? Um, one clue here is this is like mutation frequency, you know, there, and a C to T is the most common type of mutation that happens in COVID. And all of these reversions they're pointing out are C to T. So this is something that's likely to happen just by chance, or it's the most likely to happen by chance. Another way is like, so this is the lineage A root in this diagram, and I counted how many possible mutations you'd have off of it. And I found like 41 in this diagram. So you have 41 different chances to have a mutation which could be a reversion. And if a reversion's 4% likely on average, I said the odds you get two reversions are 67%. Uh, I think Yuri said it's 3% likely, so that's still going to say two reversions is 50% likely. Um, so this is one of the ways I proved this to myself, that this is not super suspicious, is like you have a lot of chances for this to happen, and it's more likely to just be something that reverted. Uh, the other way I thought about looking at it is, remember this is Picard's graph, this is lineage B and lineage A, both growing in diversity over time. And we have lineage B as a control group. So if you have lineage A reversions, you should also have lineage B reversions. And so I reproduced his diagram and I added both the A and B reversions. And so I did a light blue color for any reversion found off lineage B. And these are the 29005 and the 18060. Um, 
And so you have two lineage B reversions before you even find one of these lineage A reversions, and you keep finding reversions in both of them. And so I graph this relative to the out group. So zero is lineage B, minus two is lineage A. A uh, lineage B reversion is going to be minus one, and a lineage A reversion is going to be minus three. So um, evolution's not a ladder. Also, like graphing it relative to the out group is kind of arbitrary. You can you can also graph it relative to lineage B, and then lineage A is a plus two, and a reversion is a plus one, and a double reversion is a plus number. Like evolution is just this. 15? Okay, so evolution is this like 30,000 dimensional space where it can just mutate in all these directions. It's not just this ladder where it goes from bat to human. And this is mostly just like interpret it, misinterpreting this to say, okay, if it's more bat-like, that means it came earlier. When really these things are, these reversions actually came later um, and they just happen to be closer to the bat. And then Picard's paper dealt with this too. He, he looked at all these possible reversions. He found 23 of them the way he was doing it, and 83% of those were C to T, like the ones we're talking about. So that's the ones you find. Um, he also found a case where this Malaysian patient was like Prokov 2 plus even one more reversion, but that doesn't let him conclude that that patient in Malaysia is who started the virus. You also need to consider like when this was found. Was it earlier in the pandemic? Was it later in the pandemic? Um, and, and this is what Picard did with his model, is he built a model that includes time and location, or not location, just time and genomes. And it figures out like what's the most likely thing to have started the pandemic. And his model says it's less than 0.01% that each of these uh, genomes started the, the pandemic. And he says it's most likely to be lineage B is the original thing. Um, I'm trying to remember now, I think Yuri claimed that Picard had discarded certain intermediate things. Can you respond to that in some capacity? Or? Let's, I'm, I'll, that's a different section. I'll, we'll talk about it later. Okay. We'll, we'll get to intermediates later. Yeah, we're, this model is based on the assumption that the interme intermediates are not valid. Um, and he's considering two intermediates that could be the source. He's saying uh, C slash C, which is halfway in between A and B, is one possible intermediate, and T slash T is another. Um, and T slash T is really unlikely because the C to T bias. So it would have to go the wrong direction. It would have to go T to C twice right away for that. So that's less likely. C slash C is more likely because it could go C to T with both of these right away. Um, but his model rules that out because he's also looking at what kind of like phylogeny it is. And in his simulations, the most common one is this polytomy, which is like one root with all these strains sticking off of it. And then he's saying it's very unlikely that you get one root and it splits off into two equal polytomies, which is what the C slash C intermediate would be. He's finding that's basically 0% in his model. And then the other thing he's saying is only 3% is like it starts as B and then an A splits off and becomes this one huge clade that's bigger than the others or vice versa. Uh, that's That's possible. It could start as A or B at the market, but it's just unlikely in this model. Um, another way I've thought about this is like you can draw polytomies instead of that tree, you can draw them as like this radial thing, like it splits off, that's in the middle. So if you're saying Prokov 2 was the start, you'd be saying it's like, oh, this point right here at the edge of A, this is the actual ancestor, and then it went over here, and then it became A, and then it started spreading. And that doesn't happen in most of the models. What happens is the, the thing that started spreads outwards in all directions. And this is just a computer model, but I decided to try to confirm it with like real world data, like what usually happens when there's one introduction, because that's happened a bunch of times now in the pandemic. So this is Shinfati market, um, is a single introduction from this frozen fish and single introduction, single polytomy of all the cases coming off of it. Uh, I found another case, this was Australia. There was a quarantine hotel, one person got sick, escaped the quarantine hotel, caused a single polytomy. Uh, Seattle, single person, single polytomy. This is a single introduction of COVID into Russia. Uh, this is Louisiana, Louisiana Mardi Gras, uh, single polytomy. A diamond princess, single person on the ship, single polytomy, it radiates. And to save you time, I found a bunch more of these, but I just linked them instead. So it's not just this, that his model says this is what's most likely, it's what the real world data says. 
is what happens when you get a sin single introduction of COVID. So that's why he thinks that the double polytomy means two different introductions from animals. Um, this is more speculative, but it looks like the introduction of Omicron is a single polytomy, so Omicron might have actually come from a single case. And are there any real-world counterexamples? Um, this paper from Alex Washburn said Austria might be, but I looked over this and it looks like it's actually just a bunch of different single polytomies that were contact traced to different introductions. Um, so yeah, polytomies have kept happening through the pandemic and reversions have kept happening through the pandemic. Um. Peter, so I apologize. Yeah. This may be clear to others, but I'm to to contextualize this. You're saying that it is very likely that a single individual or a single introduction can produce subsequent cases that do not con converge on a bifurcating phylogenetic tree, but in fact look like can look like any number of downstream things. It could be three, it could be five, it could be two. Is that I'm correct? saying that it. it a normal case for a single introduction is that like it splits off in a bunch of different mutations off of that root, and none of those are typically larger than the other clades. Like here, maybe you have this one's a little bit bigger than that one, but it's not normal that like one clade is becomes this huge. Like lineage A is thirty three percent of the cases, and lineage B is sixty six percent of the cases. So uh, that that's not a normal pattern. And that's what Picard's model finds. Uh, nine minutes, just heads up. Okay, <laughs> see what I can go through in nine minutes. Um, I was gonna yield at this point because this was for after Sorry, that. I forgot to push my mute button. Um, so you're saying lineage B is ancestral to lineage A? I'm saying they're separate introductions. Okay. So it's kind of hard to say that one's ancestral to the other. Um, uh, when we talk about how lineage A had two fewer mutations compared to a wild, um, am I understanding correctly, there's a, some very specific wild virus is being used as a baseline. You say how many mutations lineage A has, how many mutations lineage B has, and you take the difference and it's two. Yes, right, but it's actually not two, it's like, it's 12,000 if it's broke off two. 12,000 for one is 11,098 for the other. So you're assuming that all those were correct. I mean, it could actually be that those two mutations were in the raccoon dog virus or whatever animal it was. So, hey, um, so you're saying lineage A and lineage B both differ from a specific wild virus by 12,000 nucleotides? Yeah. Um, and one has two, B has two more than A. And the other 12,000, they both have the same differences because so they differ yeah. from each other they, by two they only differ by yeah exactly and so this works into the probability in a lot of ways um so it's not just like we talked about the base factor and the erratum for picard where he's he's saying it's maybe not as unlikely to get the two lineages but what his theory explains is a lot of different things it explains why b can look older than a but it can also have more diversity than A, because it, it's got twice as many cases, and I have the wrong slide up here, but, um, and that's hard to explain if it's a single introduction, because like if A started at the lab, but now it's mutated less than B, uh, it's hard to explain how that's possible. And so Picard's model both explains why the genetic clock is wrong, but it also explains why the polytomy looks the way it does with the two separate polytomies. And his model also explains um, the fact that the earliest A cases were found right next to the market. Um, we have the sample at the market, the A20, the glove sample, but we also have the other two December A cases, and one of them lives two kilometers away, and the other one lives, uh, like, or sorry, stayed at a hotel right next to the market before they got sick. So, and th those people could be anywhere. They could be close to the lab. They could be anywhere in town. So I'm assigning like a one in... 2,000 odds to the two lineages things, and that's coming in a few different places. One is coming from like a factor of 50 from the two cases being found so close, and I'm giving a factor of 11 from it being uh, the, the genetic clock being wrong, if you assume the lab leak, and I'm also giving this like factor of four just for the two polytomies, and those are three different things you need to explain if you have some other explanation for why this happened. 
And also if it's a lab leak, you just need to account for the fact that they're like seven days apart. Like Picard's models say A started like seven days after B. So if if like the first, if it did start at the lab and then it became the super spreader at the market, that happened like within a week. And that's super unlikely that within the first 20 patients or whatever, it ended up just at this wildlife market and caused the only super spreader there. Sorry, this is, uh, I'm sure I will have to review this more, um, but so your hypothesis is that, or what you're presenting is that there is two separate introductions that come from potentially two different infected raccoon dogs or something, or do you think it's the same or you don't take a position on that and it's kind of irrelevant? I, I don't have a position on the animal. I think raccoon dogs the most likely, but there's like five animals there that could be. Um, and I, I don't think it's probably the same animal. I think it's probably a few different animals that have a pool of infection. And I'm saying that two separate animals infected two separate people. Most likely it's probably actually more than that. Um, and a few of them didn't stick. Like two of the infections stuck. I think Picard's model says it's like up to eight infections actually. Okay. And, and, and we know this is normal because multiple spillovers are normal. Like we looked at this last time, like MERS spilled over lots of times and when COVID was on mink farms, it spilled back into humans multiple times. So that's just what happens when you have infected animals. They infect multiple people there. Yeah. So what is the, um, another thing I'm getting confused by, and like, I'm much more familiar with like bacterial genetics or kind of like um, phylogenies there. What are the, the molecular clock analysis done here, or the idea that one, what Picard does to say that this one is ancestral to the other one, that is based on two factors. It's one based on assuming that your progenitor is a bat virus of some type, RATG13, and is also, and it also something else, like, I apologize, but I do not understand. Yeah, um, it's not only his model, everybody, that's everybody's model. Like I cited um, Pipes 2021 on the first day, um, and she says it's like a 96% odds that uh, B came before A. And it comes from like, like this, basically, like, a started later and it's got less diversity and less cases. And even if you exclude the market, even if you assume the market cases were like um, ascertainment bias, sampling bias, you still, you take those out and you still have more diversity for B. You look at the cases around the world and um, you have more B cases. And uh, Zhangnan has, yeah, we have this in multiple data sets. Like, even if you plot them with, like I, I plotted them without the two nucleotide gap and you still have twice as many B cases as A and you can still see that there's like the diversity in B is growing faster than A. So B started earlier. And it doesn't matter where, like this is Jesse Bloom's paper on the early cases, which weren't actually early, they were like January, February. But even in his paper, you have more B cases than A cases because B started earlier. And this is another one I found. This is Zhongnan Hospital, which is the one that's like a mile away from the Wuhan lab. So if any place is going to have more A cases, you'd think it would be that one. But they have exactly the same thing. They have twice as many B cases as A cases, and they only have like one of these Prokof 2 cases they have marked here. And also they didn't find any intermediates in that study. So like every, every study around the world confirms the same. Like even if there's sampling bias in Wuhan where they only found the market cases, once it got outside of Wuhan, you should see more A cases because if A was earlier, it should have had more time to exponentially grow. And, and so the molecular clock is basically just, it's like a program called Beast usually that they, that, yeah. And, I'm familiar with that. I just didn't. Yeah, yeah. But in an intuitive sense, it's just like, it's got more diversity and it's growing faster. And, uh, okay. and here's the diagram I meant to show earlier. Like if, if, if B, you know, if A came first, like why hasn't it mutated more than B? But they, the claim is that lineage B is more infectious than lineage A, then isn't that enough to explain why? I don't think that holds up because people? like you can see the mutation rate and it's really about the same for both of them. And I don't, I don't think that was actually like, that's measurably true. That's like another version of, you know, I, there's like these layers of cope that we need to work through of why it's not the market and why it, why it could still be the lab. And that's another like possible cope where you say, oh, maybe B is more infectious. I and I don't know. think that would I was in the impression we know B is more infectious than A. Is that not true? No, okay. I don't think I don't think there's really any measurable difference okay. there. Well, what, and also, like, I don't think that would make it look older either. Like, if it grew faster, I think that would bias it to make it look newer. You know. Well, maybe we can settle this in your last thirty-four seconds. 
Um, <laughs> what is around today? I thought it was Lineage B has per persisted. Lineage B, yeah, Lineage B turned into other things. But, I mean, if it's got a founder advantage where it's got twice as many cases, that's more likely to stick. Um, but I don't, I, I don't know if that was random or, like, if those two really made a huge difference. I think the two mutations at the beginning just fairly random and it's stuck for that reason. Do those two mutations affect, um, are they significant to coding? Do they affect amino acids or are they insignificant? One, one is synonymous and one's not synonymous. And I don't, and neither one is in spike. Neither is in a super, I think one's in ORF1 and one's in like ORF8 or I don't, I'd have to look it up. And they're, yeah, they're, they're pretty random. And, you know, it's not like one had D614G and the other didn't or something really important like that. Okay. Okay. Um, well, thank you, Peter. Thank you. Excellent. Both of you, excellent opening presentations. I'm going to um, stop the recording now to give our first session. Then let's take a 10 minute break to stretch. And then we'll start with rebuttals with Yuri first um, and uh, 45 minutes for each person. Um, you can use your time as you see fit. I think last time it worked well to go back and forth um, answering some of the key questions that the judges have and that you each have for each other. Sound good? Okay.